The sirens went and we woke up and then all of a sudden the bangs came. The bombs were falling. We were petrified. They bombed the uh, co-op bakery, which made a big flame. The gasometers made big flames. St. Christopher's Church made big flames. These flames lit up the area for them to concentrate in that area alone. Now, when there was an air raid siren, we had to quickly get whatever we could, take a blanket. We had to go into the caves on Sherwood Street. There was one uh, entrance in Sherwood Street, another on Mansfield Road. It was absolutely eerie that you could smell all this smoke and flames. Then there was a big bang, a landmine had landed on a street. The next thing was clatter, 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 bang, all down the road. I looked out the window again and there, firebombs burning everywhere. Late afternoon, a mid-November day in 1940, some 400 German bombers assemble in their various airfields in the north of occupied France, ready to take off for a night raid on Britain. They'd been doing this day after day for more than two months in their attempt to bomb London into submission, attacking the capital every single night without a break since the 7th of September 1940. But tonight was different. London was to be left alone for its first raid-free night in 68 consecutive days. The date? the 14th of November, 1940. The target, a city in the very heart of England, Coventry. By the time the operation had been carried out, a new word had entered the English language, Coventry a combination of the words concentrate and Coventry. The Midland city had unwillingly given its name to a ruthless new form of concentrated aerial bombardment 
which was to become an only too familiar feature of World War II. The raid exceeded the sheer intensity of anything the German Air Force had ever done before. Some historians believe there could be reasons other than purely strategic for the intense ferocity of this particular raid. And they claim it could be traced back to Bavaria's capital city, Munich. Munich is one of Germany's old historic cities and one of its largest. It had long enjoyed a reputation not only for its charm, but for its lively character and fondness for festivities. A fact well borne out as a center of Bavaria's brewing industry by its world famous annual Oktoberfest beer festival and by the presence all over the city of its beer cellars, drinking taverns and beer gardens. Its people love to congregate and celebrate in these establishments throughout the year and a particular group of people were doing so more and more frequently in the early 1920s. They were members of a political party called the National Socialists, known as Nazi for short. They soon felt strong enough to attempt to overthrow the Bavarian government by force. The date was November the 9th, 1923. The attempt failed after clashes in the beer cellars and the streets. But during the next few years, their leader and his followers gradually rose to power. From that time on, the date of the attempted rising, November the 9th, became an almost sacrosanct fixture in the Nazi calendar. Each year on the eve of that date, the party faithful got together in Munich to celebrate and make speeches about old times. And the 1940 meeting would be a special one for Hitler, the first since his great Blitzkrieg triumphs a few months before. Unfortunately for him, however, the RAF chose that date to raid a very special German target. And that day, a squadron of British bombers set out on the long flight to Munich. It was hardly a coincidence that the RAF had picked that target on that date, knowing that the Nazi top brass would certainly be very strongly represented in the city that night. The British aircraft met the full force of the German anti-aircraft defences. But the raid was successfully carried out. Whatever damage the British bombers may have inflicted on Munich that night was relatively minor compared to the damage it inflicted on the Führer's self-esteem and his hopes for the most triumphal annual November celebration ever. The British attack that night aroused Hitler's deepest fury and he immediately set to work to plan his reprisal as soon as possible. Coventry was selected as the target for a few days later. Thursday, the 14th of November, 1940. The German pre-flight briefing that day included a special message from the commander of one of the attacking squadrons which read, you all know, gentlemen, the purpose of tonight's operation. Our task is to repay the attack on Munich by the English on the night of November the 8th. We shall not repay it in the same manner by smashing up harmless civilians' houses, but we shall do it in a way that will completely stun their leaders. We have accordingly received orders to destroy the industries of Coventry tonight. You all know what that means. The city is one of the chief centers of armaments and war weapons used against us by the enemy air force. If we can paralyze this armament center tonight, we shall have dealt another stunning blow 
to Herr Churchill's war production. Tomorrow morning, the factories of Coventry must lie in smoke and ruins. Good luck, gentlemen. Good luck. The fleets were composed of mainly Heinkel 111s and Junkers 88s with a few Dornier 17s. The Heinkel 111 was to become familiar to most Britons, easily recognizable by its readily identified shape and outlines. A low-wing, all-metal, twin-engined aircraft with a crew of four, a 4,400-pound bomb load, three machine guns, and a speed of approximately 250 miles an hour. Its brother, Junkers 88, was also a low-wing, twin-engined aircraft carrying a 4,400-pound bomb load and also armed with three machine guns, but faster than the Heinkel and capable of averaging over 300 miles an hour, able to outpace many of the fighter aircraft of the day. It could also be used as a dive bomber. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of ancient Pompeii and the mystery of the princes in the tower to the life of Anne Boleyn and D-Day. Sign up via the link in the description. The raid, codenamed Monshine Sonata, or Moonlight Sonata, was carried out by 145 aircraft of Luftflotte Air Fleet No. 2 and 304 planes of Luftflotte No. 3, and each aircraft or group was allotted its own detailed specified target, even down to a named building or street area of the city. As the German aircraft were heading towards the city, the people of Coventry were going about their normal business, coming home from work, going on to the night shift, possibly going to the cinema or a dance, and totally unaware of the fury that was to be unleashed on them within an hour or so. The most intensive, concentrated, and incessant aerial bombardment for a city of its size since the invention of the aeroplane. The leading German planes, a dozen Heinkel 111s of Kampfgruppe, Battle Group 100, reached the city and their target area at 19.20 hours that evening, coming in at approximately three minute intervals between each aircraft, and dropped nearly 1,000 incendiary bombs, whose fires lit the area for the main bomber force, and within one hour of the start of the raid, crews reported that the entire city area was engulfed in a sea of flames. The raid continued unabated over a period of 10 hours, and even German crews with considerable experience already in the bombing of London agreed that they'd never seen anything like it on this scale before. They could smell the burning city from a height two miles above Coventry, and they were able to see the fires for most of their return flight to their bases in France, some of them more than 100 miles away further south than Paris. When the all clear sounded and people began to emerge into the streets at dawn, the city scene that met their eyes was unrecognizable. Scarcely a single building remained intact. The citizens entered a world of smoke and flames and smoldering rubble.
I was a delivery boy working for a firm in Nottingham and I had an urgent delivery to make to Coventry and it was a case of the night, morning after the night before. However, I got down to Coventry and I had to move towards the city centre where most of the damage had been done. And as I approached the city centre, there was absolutely masses and masses of host parts, fireman's host parts everywhere. And the only way round was to go past the church, the cathedral, in the city centre. And it was just a burning, smouldering ruin. And you could see from straight through from one side to the other, it was absolutely, well, I've never seen such a sight in all in my days. Well, in actual fact, when I got through the masses of uh, hose piping uh, around the city centre, I was trying to find my way to the place that I got to deliver. And actually, I found it impossible because of the road hold-ups and everything was chaos, complete chaos. And there's still smoke and steam hissing and gushing out from every place that I could see, kind of. So. I thought it's safest, best and safest to turn around and go back from where I come from, Nottingham. It was just that way on. I just dare not go any further. All I can remember was the firemen looking really tired and policemen all running around just doing the, what they could. There was very little that anybody could do, to be candid. But the look on these men's faces, tired, tired to the eyes. There was red, and oh, God. What they went through that night, only God above knows, believe me. It was terrible. Operation Moonlight Sonata had destroyed or severely damaged most of the city centre, commercial, industrial and residential, as well as supplies of gas, electricity and water. Worst of all was the number of missing and dead, over 500 killed and more than 800 seriously injured. Graves had to be prepared for the tragic file of mourners carrying wreaths and flowers a few days later. The city of Coventry mourned its air raid victims when nearly a thousand people attended the first funeral service. 172 of Coventry's dead were being buried in a common grave, yet even while the last rites were being performed, an air battle was taking place high above the cemetery. Even while Coventry mourned her dead, the Nazi came to renew his terror. The comment was not strictly accurate. The German planes above were not on a bombing mission, but on a reconnaissance to assess the damage that they'd inflicted upon the city on the night of November the 14th, 15th. Their reconnaissance aircraft were, of course, fired upon by the British anti-aircraft as they made their way photographing across the area. German aircraft had been carrying out photographic reconnaissance operations for many years, even before the start of World War II. Early reconnaissance flights were relatively primitive affairs, using ordinary airplanes, often without fixed camera positions, even the pilot himself having to take 
handheld shots from the aircraft as it covered the object area. The photographs were processed and printed directly from the plane and used as a basis for detailed, up-to-date mapping and planning projected campaigns. Much of the German success in rapidly overrunning Poland and, later, Denmark and the Low Countries was in no small part due to those early pioneering aerial photographic flights before the bombing of Coventry. Photographs were taken over Warsaw and other towns in Poland, as well as in the neighboring countries, which were to provide valuable information for setting up targets for air raids and indeed ground attacks during the Blitzkrieg which began at the very start of the Second World War. By the time the night blitz raids had begun over Britain, reconnaissance flights were being carried out in superior aircraft with greatly improved photographic technical equipment and facilities, including fixed camera positions. This enabled the aircraft which flew over Coventry after the devastating night blitz on the city, even in the face of spirited ACAC fire from the British guns below, to produce detailed photographs of Coventry of high quality showing the main targets in the city, including the Alvis factory, Rolls-Royce, the Daimler works. The main damage occurred in the medieval center and around Broadgate, an area of at least a quarter of a million square feet was completely destroyed. The market hall, the fish market, Owen Owen multi-story building, all bombed or gutted by fire. But for most citizens, the worst loss was the destruction of their cathedral. For over 500 years, St. Michael's Cathedral had stood at the center of the city, more a part of Coventry than Coventry itself. Of all Britain's cathedrals, Coventry was the only one to suffer destruction on such a massive scale. The King has been to see how the people of Coventry were carrying on after their terrible ordeal. Not only did he find that their spirit was magnificent and that everything possible was being done to alleviate suffering, but it was also quite evident that his five-hour tour, accompanied by Mr. Herbert Morrison, had greatly encouraged them. This was the cathedral. The city, having been mercilessly bombed throughout a whole night without regard to military targets, now presents a grim appearance of devastation. The cathedral spire and the font remain. The rest is rubble. But all that the cathedral represented and the spirit of this centuries-old city lives on. During the autumn and early winter months, England's second largest city, Birmingham, had been attacked on a number of occasions, along with other Midlands towns, though not yet on a major scale. It was on the night of Wednesday, December the 11th, that Birmingham suffered its first major air raid from the Junkers and Heinkels of Air Fleet No. 3. The weather over Birmingham was predominantly clear and nearly 300 aircraft dropped over 300 tons of high explosive bombs between 6 o'clock that night and 7.15 the following morning. Good moonlight helped identify target locations and the crews had no difficulty in bombing visually so that a very large proportion of the bombs fell in the town center according to plan, causing severe damage. It was the largest raid that Birmingham had so far endured. Bombs fell in Priory Road, a few hundred yards from the family home of Neville Chamberlain, 
Britain's first wartime prime minister, who'd recently died. The city was frequently raided during the following months, and considerable damage was suffered in the area of the Bull Ring, by commercial buildings and people's homes, as well as important Birmingham industrial concerns, such as Wolseley Motors, ICI Chemicals, the Dunlop Rubber Company, the Austin Motor Works, the Singer Works in Coventry Road. Another Midland city which was to suffer severe bombardment was Nottingham, a city of some 150,000 citizens at the outbreak of the war, center of the lace-making industry, with a prominent university, which among others, D. H. Lawrence had attended. I was born on Independence Street in Radford at Nottingham and the day that war was announced was a beautiful sunny Sunday morning. All the neighbours came out into the backyard and were all chatting and having a drink and all worrying and being worried to death about being gassed by the Germans. Hitler may use gas, so we must all be prepared for that sort of party. The police, like the fighting services, are trained to carry on with their ordinary duties while wearing respirators. So take a tip from them. Get on good terms with your gas mask. That particular evening, the uh, siren went off by mistake and all the neighbours, we, we'd already got shelters built in the backyard, but uh, my mother, she wouldn't go in there. She said it smelled to tomcats and dogs. If you are provided with a steel shelter and have not erected it, do so at once. First, dig a pit four feet deep. Then, build your shelter inside it. In those first weeks of the war, the general public received its first bombardment. Streams of government advice and a list of do's and don'ts which seemed positively endless. Always keep your gas mask handy in the house. Never go out without it. Note down official instructions, otherwise you might forget them. Keep pencil and paper by your wireless set. Avoid panic buying. There are plenty of food supplies in the country. Those who have laid in an emergency food supply should not consume it now. Continue to obtain your normal supplies from your usual shops. Clear your loft of all junk to minimize risk of fire. Have buckets of water and sand on every landing. If you have no sand, use dry earth. To obscure all lights in your house. Do not use the telephone except for very short, urgent messages. Everyone should carry an identity label with name and address clearly written. These labels should be sewn on children's clothing. Railway and road services will be drastically reduced and subject to alteration at short notice. If you have made plans to go away, remember that the government has its own plans for the evacuation of school children and others. Your arrangements must not interfere with these. When war broke out, I was six years of age. Um, I lived with my gran and my mother in the city of Nottingham. Uh, I was told about a week after the war broke out that I was to be evacuated. Um, I was packed off in a coach with a load of other children, with a gas mask, etc., you know, a little carrier bag, and I was evacuated to Worksop. I stayed there for a long, long while. Well, I say a long while. It seemed a long while to me, but it would probably be only be about nine months. Um, I was so upset at being away from mother. Mother didn't like being parted from me. So I came home. And when I got home, we weren't living with Granny anymore, but my mother was actually um, looking after a very big house, which was on Ossington Villas off Sherwood Street. Um, and the gentleman who owned it was at war. Now, when there was an air raid siren, we had to 
quickly get whatever we could, take a blanket. We had to go into the caves on Sherwood Street. There was one uh, entrance in Sherwood Street, another on Mansfield Road. We went on there, of course, as children, we thoroughly enjoyed it, playing around. We didn't realise the seriousness. When you hear the warning signals, take cover at once. You may hear a siren rising and falling in pitch, or hooters sounding short blasts. The warning may also be given by short signals on police whistles. Do not be alarmed by noise in an air raid. Much of it will be the noise of our own guns dealing with the raiders. When the sirens and hooters sound a long, steady, unbroken signal, it means that the raiders have passed. If there has been gas, Wait until you hear this bell. It will tell you when there is no longer any danger from gas. Only then is it safe to leave your shelter and remove your gas mask. No one in this country of ours wants war. But don't be alarmed. Keep a good heart. Britain is a nation prepared. That preparedness depended to a great extent on a large flow of volunteers into the numerous auxiliary services. There are many essential services calling now for recruits. We need nurses, stretcher bearers, firemen, canteen workers. Then again, we can begin our own military training. Here are some factory workers who have organized their own defense corps and drill in their lunch hour. When the Blitz campaign was almost over, Nottingham suffered its first full raid on the night of May the 8th, 1941. May the 8th, the night of May the 8th, my father was in the RAF, he'd gone away. And mother and I were alone in the house, down Radford, where, where I was born. And uh, the siren went off. And we, we didn't go in the shelter, because mother wouldn't go in the shelter. So we all went down into the cellar. And uh, after a while, uh, mother, she stopped being afraid. And we, she took me back upstairs, opened the, the back door, scullery door, and looked out. And there was a very, very full moon and we could hear the bombers going over, this drone of the bombers going over. And uh, she said, I suppose, so as I wouldn't be scared, she said, oh, they won't bomb here. They're going over to Derby. They're aiming for Rolls Royce. They'll get that lot. That prediction, unfortunately for Nottingham, failed to materialize because the Luftwaffe's navigational beams that night were deflected by the British defenses and the German planned attack on Derby and Rolls-Royce did not take place. Nottingham, instead, bore the full brunt of the raid. In this raid alone, Nottingham received almost 90% of all its wartime bombardment. I remember the Blitz, May the 8th, 1941. We had our own little private air raid shelter. There was my brother, and my younger sister and my mother. Dad was what, night patrolling, uh, night watching, and uh, the sirens went and we woke up and then all of a sudden the bangs came, the bombs were falling. We were petrified. They could hear the ACAC guns from the gun factory and there was a big army bomb, uh, site near the Trem uh, Wilford Bridge, not Trent Bridge, Wilford Bridge, and uh, it was absolutely eerie that you could smell all this smoke and flames. Then there was a big bang, a landmine had landed on a street, um, Launder Street. Then the, when the thingy was all over, uh, 
next morning, we all had a, a run out to see what had happened and it just smelt of smoke. All oh, the stench was unbearable. Suddenly I heard the Jerry aircraft again. There's a, a rushing noise. I could hear this rushing noise coming towards me as if, it, but about, I should say, 500 y yards above my head. I heard and saw, my, beg pardon, I didn't see the bottom, but I heard them whistling down over my head. And the next thing was, I, they crashed, almighty crash. One landed at the back of uh, the church on Sindrill Road. Caused quite a lot of damage there, extensive damage. And the other on opposite side of the road was at the co-op bakery. I remember the co-op got hit. And what made it worse was that it had been my cousin's birthday and her father was on duty there and it got burnt very, very bad. But there were so many people in that bakery and the dairy got killed that night. It was dreadful. Well, the places that they'd bombed was mainly the railway along Colic Road, Snenton Hermitage, over the Trent. They'd followed the Trent down all within this circle that they'd drilled up earlier in the night. So whether they were a Pathfinder group, we don't know. They bombed the uh, co-op bakery, which made a big flame. The gasometers made big flames. St. Christy First Church made big flames. These flames lit up the area for them to concentrate in that area alone. I heard the sound of aircraft overhead. And mother woke up. She said, George, she says, I believe it's Jerry. She says, I said, well, look, quick, get the children into the air raid shelter. And the, within a few seconds after that, there was a clatter, 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 bang, 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 all along the road. And I looked out of the bedroom window. Lo and behold, all around, was incendiary bombs burning away down Broxter Lane. So immediately I got dre quickly dressed and made my way outside. Mother got the children to the air raid shelter, Anderson shelter, and then the next thing was the corporation had left all sandbags around the lamp post to put out bombs in case it did fall. Well, naturally, the first thoughts were the instructions which we'd been given during the war. Uh, to carry on with these bombs was to be cautious because some did explode. However, I got the first sandbag run up to the bomb as it was lying on the floor there on the road, burning away brightly. Broxley Lane really resembled <laughs> Guy Fawkes night. But anyway, I uh, thought, well, I've got to get this one over this fence. And I got this sandbag and I jumped over a five foot fence with the sandbag in man. Really was. And experience, and there was, I, put, I think I put about eight or nine of these bombs out. I was playing in the backyard, and I can't remember, I think it would be about. 19, the end of 1940, on one aeroplane came over and we think he'd got lost. And at the top of our entry, there was a, a foundry and I can remember the plane coming over and I found out after, afterwards that he did in fact kill some people, machine gunning them. And I looked up to see what was going over and it was really near. I could see the pilot sitting there got a, a leather helmet on and he was just firing at everybody, you know, children, anybody that happened to be in the way. During 1941, I was on the way back to school after lunch and a lone German bomber came along the street at rooftop height. It was a Heinkel 111. It, I could remember vividly the engines roaring and I looked up and saw the gunner in the front shooting 
it was bouncing, his gun was bouncing, and he was waving it about, shooting at the boys on the playing field near the, uh, <coughs> near the school we went to. This made me angry at the time, but the boys came in and no one had been hit. So years on, I think, was this chap aiming to miss because he could see that we were children, as I could see that he was a German Air Force bloke in a black leather suit or a black suit. So I think he might have been aiming to miss. I gave him the benefit of the doubt. And later on the same day, I went to the lace market. My mother's sister kept a cafe there. And my mother sent me up there to see if she was OK after this night of bombing. And the lace market had been badly hit. And uh, I had to carry my bicycle in the narrow streets, which were full of debris and fireman's hoses. The place was still burning. And my aunt's cafe, my mother's sister's cafe, was destroyed, but they were safe. They hadn't been in it when it was uh, flattened. Well, I used to work in the lace market. Now, the lace market was a place that got hit badly. And uh, I was working for the initial towel supply company, which meant I was pushing a cycle around with a load of towels in it to deliver to customers. And some of my customers, when I got there, they were just, uh, the firemen were just dousing the flames down. We had to lift the bike over the, all the hose pipes and uh, everything, and over the rubble that was cascaded onto the road. Uh, the old Mood Hall, one of my main customers, I went there, and uh, that was on the corner of Friar Lane. And I should say about, about 50 yards up the road, it had been blasted, and just the shell of the front was left standing. And after a few years, it was demolished and uh, it looks like shops now. Uh, during May 1941, Nottingham suffered a very heavy air raid. Uh, something in the order of 130 German bombers over a short period of time bombed the southern part of the city where I lived in the meadows. I was a newspaper boy and I delivered papers, newspapers before I went to school. The newspapers came from London on time by rail London had not been bombed that night, apparently. So I set off in my newspapers into the meadows, and the meadows was full of debris, bits of a burning paper floating down from the sky from a boots factory that had been badly bombed, broken glass, bits of brick and all sorts all over the place. Part of my newspaper round had been demolished by a landmine, Charmwood Terrace, and the newspapers that should have gone there, I had to take back to the shop and tell the people that the place has no longer existed. It was just a heap of bricks. As children, the next day, we was oh, all for it. We wanted to see what had happened. We went round to the places like uh, Trent Lane, the co-op, and places like this that had been bombed, all these factories that had been built. We made it a little guest amongst the kids how many sites you'd actually seen. It was a, it was like a glory hunt. Something that, cowboys and Indians type of thing. When we went to have a look where the bombs had hit, it was a laundry had gone. The houses were covered in red and blue dye. The government factory had just lost a few things, but the, um, Bridge, Wilford Bridge, was safe, but the, that had had a big bomb at uh, the side. It hit uh, Taylor's news agents. Um, there was the fairground was absolutely demolished, and that was at the side of a pub. And then we saw the big tail of the bomb, and we all started collecting shrapnel. As boys, we I went round. We you made it your business to go around and see these little places that had been done because the night before we were frightened to bloody death. But we weren't the next day, in the daylight, we could see what had happened then. But we'd gone around and seen this sort of thing then. 23 sites I got, officially. The night we moved in, that's when Nottingham was raided. And Mum just thought, oh, it, it was just the guns, you know. We could see the guns from the bedroom window at Bestwood, so we looked. But anyway, the next morning, it was the Sherwood Street had been hit. And I do remember the playing in those that row of houses that had been hit, picking the bits and pieces up and 
that sort of thing. My father came home from leave. I remember he took me all round Nottingham looking at the parts that had been bombed. The register office was one, and part of uh, uh, the library where D.H. Lawrence used to study there. There's Trivet's factory on uh, Hollow Stone. There was the, the college on Shakespeare Street. There was one, a calf on Friar Lane. All these places were, it just looked like a lump of rubble. Uh, at the bottom of Carlton Hill, on, uh, there was an air raid shelter down there that had received a hit that night. And uh, that was down when I went past it. Of course, we couldn't get to it because the police was all—it was all cordoned off by the police and the firemen again, and ambulance services were there carrying the bodies out. So that was that. During this period, before America entered the war, visits to bombed cities by high-ranking American statesmen were greatly welcomed. Mr. Wendell Wilkie proved as popular a visitor to Coventry as to London. His tour in Britain has been curtailed, but he has inspected the ruins of Coventry and of Coventry Cathedral, where he was accompanied by the bishop. So now he'll be able to tell America what he has seen for himself. He also visited factories carrying on at full pressure in spite of the blitz. And at Birmingham too, he saw both sides of the picture, the war effort of the city rising superior to all the damage done. When it seemed that the Blitz campaign was drawing to an end, the Luftwaffe returned to strike at Birmingham once more. Night raids over Britain have lately increased. A few score aircraft coming over by way of reply to the Royal Air Force hundreds that have been blasting Germany. Birmingham has been one of the enemy's targets. Damage was done and lives lost. The same is true of other places in the Midlands and also in the eastern counties. And although Germany's reply to our bombing has not yet been on the 1940-1941 scale, we should certainly allow for the return of the still heavier blitz. If it doesn't come, nothing is lost. If it does, we shall be ready to beat it again. Fighting 600 fires that night had made enormous demands on Birmingham's water supplies. In fact, 60% of the city was without mains water. The next day, many people had to queue for water at supply points set up around the city. They had no idea just how perilously low that water supplies had fallen, to the point where one more raid like that next night would be a disaster. Fortunately, the Luftwaffe switched to another target altogether. The Blitz was, of course, fundamentally concerned with the destruction of towns. But bombs were occasionally dropped in the surrounding countryside, either on specific, isolated targets, or indiscriminately by individual aircraft which had become detached or separated from their squadrons. We lived at a village at Paleton. It was five miles from Rugby, and um, the bombs came on the 24th of June, 1940, at a few minutes to midnight. And, uh, <coughs> and of course, we all had to get up, and, and my parents thought I was dead. They couldn't wake me. But anyway, we got up, and we went down the road and sat under the hedge. And then the caretaker from the school came by and he took us to his house because the school was not far from us and that was bombed. And, uh, and then the next morning, my brothers and my father got up early and went to see the animals and, and uh, one cow was killed and one had shrapnel in its leg. And the people in the cottage next door, they uh, were taken to hospital. <laughs> During the early months of 1941, though the intensity and frequency of the night raids overall began to decrease to some degree, 
Nevertheless, one town or another in the Midlands still suffered damage. But as the months of winter passed, a gradual but noticeable change in the public mood of the bombed townspeople seemed to be emerging. A feeling that this had all now been going on just a bit too long, that the time for brave and stolid British acceptance was past. A feeling that was becoming increasingly reflected in the media of the day. Now, a word or two to the government and the powers that be. While the courageous attitude of the British people is beyond praise, it is very important to take note of another aspect of their mood. You don't hear anybody saying, we can take it now. Why? Not because it isn't true, we take taking it for granted. But the war has moved on, and the phrase which fits our present sentiment is, they've got it coming to them. They, that is the Germans, have got it coming to them. We can bide our time if we know that sooner or later, preferably sooner, the Germans are going to go through it too. The anxiety and the suspense of watching, the first throbbing note of the Raiders' engine, the bombs. The fires, the collapse of shattered buildings, the strain of firefighting, of rescue and salvage, of physical suffering, death, bereavement, all these things are going to be the lot and portion of the German people. We've got it coming to them. They've chosen this kind of war, and that's what they're going to get. In fact, the pendulum was beginning to swing the other way, and raids by the RAF on Berlin and other German cities were gathering pace. True, the damage to British towns and cities continued to be considerable. As far as the Midlands was concerned, no place of any notable size came out of the Blitz at all unscathed. And many towns still suffered severe damage to their homes and public buildings. But the collapse of Britain and British morale, which the Nazi leadership had fully expected, failed to take place. By the middle of May 1941, the German nighttime Blitz campaign against Britain was virtually at an end. <laughs> 